do some of the shading on that face now that we've got. So this is scrumbling, basically. You take heavier color on top of something that's already dry, and you just pull it on top like that. One of my favorite techniques. Mm, there we go. Just need to add some shadows. Very easy to work with watercolor. Just can't be afraid of it. Of course, I'm getting water everywhere. How does that look so far? Let's see. Okay, we gotta hurry. We're running out of time here. Let's see. I'm gonna make his shirt orange. This is a weird combo of different visual things that I use for this character. Every once in a while he'll have an orange shirt with yellow tubing on the arms. And sometimes he'll have um, a tie or, a, or a, a scarf, but always with the same pattern. But in this version, he's got the shirt and the scarf for some reason. I'm not sure what happened there. See, here's another, is a party plate with a bunch of acrylic on it, I mean uh, watercolor on it that I've saved. And these are all pre-mixed colors. So I, I rarely ever use my tubes unless I really need a color and I can't find it on any of my palettes. I rarely ever mix it, you know, need, need to use the tubes because I've been saving all my, all my uh, watercolor. It's a nice little golden. There's some this orange that I'm mixing over here looks like it has a little uh, blue maybe in it, very tiny amount, and that's creating this kind of beigey orange. Um, one of the things I learned from my other painting professor, Professor Philip Field, was a lot about color theory and mixing different colors, putting different colors together. Um, that's part of the reason why this character has an, sometimes has an orange shirt and then he's got blue fur, blue-black fur, because orange and blue are complementary colors. And when you put complementary colors together or in close proximity to each other, they do strange things to the eye. Um, this is one of the strengths of painting, actually, is the ability to take these colors and what they do to the eye when they're next to each other, and then you can play around with them. One of the most valuable lessons I've ever learned from my painting professors in college was color theory. Ten minutes? Okay, we should be able to finish this in ten minutes. I might not say much while I'm trying to. Usually I'll spend a whole day on one of these drawings and I'll just take my time. That's why you have a, pic a picture with all these different <laughs> tentacles with eyes all over them. By the time I was halfway through drawing these eyes, I was really sick of them. That's why this drawing today is so simple. And I just wanted to show you guys how to, the watercolor works. You're not really getting to see much of that, are you? Okay. Some people like to lay down one big color underneath all, all their painting, underpainting. It's called an underpainting. I'm, when I work in acrylic, I do that. I'll have a whole background color kind of set. Now the whole painting might not wind up being that color, but I'll always start with a blank color instead of blank white. I'll, I'll do a wash or something. But with watercoloring, 
one of the things I like doing is not painting the whole thing, is just adding the color to it. Um, it's just a personal choice, but painting is one of those things where it's not about um, shoot. It's not about uh, how you lay it down, it's what you lay down. So if you're laying down, you know, a, a color first, then you can push and pull. And another thing I learned from my professors that I really, I've taken with me all these years is the ability to have something, lose it, you know, you have a perfect drawing and you just cover it in paint, lose it completely, and then pull it back out of what you've done. Um, some of the best painting is done that way. You can't be afraid to cover things up and then pull them back out because you'll like the results a lot better than if you just do a straight wash and just leave it flat. Mm, the train's passing by. Whoops. Of course, painting this way, you run into problems if you're trying to do something like this sweater. How much does pattern become part of your work? How much does pattern become a, f a part of my work? What do you mean? Like different types of patterns showing up in the images? Yeah, like also with the example of the scarf. Yeah, the scarf has been a motif that this character's had for the duration of his existence. I mean, all the early drawings of him in my old sketchbooks from college have him with this scarf. And I've, I've looked for a tie. Well, it, was, it started as a tie. I've looked for a tie with a yellow polka dot in red, and I haven't been able to find a good one anywhere. Um, but patterns do play a lot, uh, a pretty big role in my work because I like visual patterns kind of engage the viewer um, and can, in some ways, I think, um, give you a sense of something. Like, it's hard to explain, but you can give a 